The expansion of the business obviously had uh, a significant effect upon the building. The building had to expand to accommodate all these new activities. And uh, if we uh, stand on the riverside looking at the face of the building, we can see how much it has expanded from that small four-storey mill that was purchased in 1873. At that time, the mill, in the early days, uh, the mill was powered by water power. And up the hillside behind the present factory is a, a small tributary stream to the River Hebden, which currently comes down underneath the road and runs underneath the mill to, to join the main river. That stream, not terribly large, but that gave the power that was needed for all the power equipment in the original mill. And uh, it ran on the, on the water power for some time. But eventually that was not enough. And uh, of course, as the 19th century progressed, all the mills moved from water power to steam power. There were local sources of coal, not very significant ones, but the major coal fields are only about 10 miles away. And therefore, with the canal and the railway, it was quite uh, feasible to import coal. And the original steam engine at Nutcliffe Mill was put in the same position as the water wheel had occupied. This is easier because uh, all the uh, the shafting and the belting which was going to carry the power to the looms and uh, other machinery was geared up to be at that point. So okay you take the wheel out and you put a steam engine in. Of course, you've got to put a floor in to put a steam engine there into what was previously what we call a wheel pit, the, uh, the hole in the ground where the, where the wheel turned and the, and the water ran away. Steam engines are very heavy pieces of equipment and uh, at Nutcliffe Mill, the uh, floor was not adequate and the floor began to sink and it was decided later that they needed to extend the mill in the other direction and a new um, engine house was built at the uh, left-hand end of the building. So the building was stretched in both directions and originally a four-storey building, it was also stretched upwards to become a five-storey building. So now as we look at it, we can see on the uh, right-hand side uh, of the image the uh, position where the water wheel was. We can still see, if we look over the wall into the river, the, the water coming out from the water course that still exists and we can see the building five storeys high. If we switch to the other end of the building, we can see that it was extended there. Remember, I mentioned the fact that we've got these small panes of glass in the middle windows to mark the position of the original small mill, and we can see that it's been extended to our left as well. And then there is uh, the newer engine house, which uh, extends a little beyond the frontage of the building, and behind that's a tall tower. This was the water tower. Steam engines need a lot of water to turn into steam, and so a good water supply was essential. Water comes down from the hillsides, but there was also a large tank on the top of this tower, so that uh, if there was any problem with water coming down from the hillside, they've got water on hand to keep, uh, to keep the machinery running for the time being. So many of the mills of this period had, the, had these water towers built. Uh, so it, it's interesting to be able to interpret what was going on and to parallel the story of the increase in trade and the increase in numbers of people employed and the commercial success of the uh, of the company with the uh, the parallel pattern in the structure of the building